everyone. And today I have with me a medical doctor. She's going to tell us a little bit about herself. Her name is Dr. Kelly Stucker, who is joining us from Minneapolis. Is that correct? In, in, in the States? We've managed to get the time zones correct. Thank you, Zoom. Um, welcome. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? First of all, tell us a little about the area you practice in medicine and why you chose that. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm Kelly Stucker. I'm from Minnesota and I'm an OBGYN. So I'm specialized in women's health. I love delivering babies. I love helping people get through infertility. And my whole career up until COVID, I was really focused on making sure that I was empowering a woman to be the best version of herself, right? And so we provided a lot of outreach for people who needed mental health resources. And through this COVID pandemic that we've all gone through, we have seen significant increase in need in mental health resources. And so in my postpartum pa patients, um, especially we're seeing a lot more postpartum anxiety and depression. So it is very rewarding to get to help them through that part of their journey as well. So um, you also, and you're still working with women's health, even during the COVID epidemic, pandemic, whatever we want to escalate it to. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I know, I keep changing. So, so um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've also founded, which is how we connected, an organisation called Patient Care Heroes. Tell us about that. Yeah, so during COVID, especially in the United States, I found this void for the medical community. And the big issue that we have is a disconnect between basically what we have, we have a big disconnect between what people need and what they're getting. And if you look at how we take care of the physician population, we're seeing significantly more physician suicides very horribly and unfortunately, and we're also seeing a lot more nurse suicides. We're seeing people leaving medicine altogether. We're seeing significant burnout. Um, before the pandemic even started, there was about 40% of women physicians left medicine or went part-time before they were six years out of residency, which is a pretty significant statistic. And that's pre-COVID. And so when you really kind of break down the barriers and see where is the root cause of some of these things, we have a real... I'm going to stop you, Kelly. That's my phone. It's my mother, and I need to turn it off. <laughs> and I'm just trying to do that. So let's just, we'll go back. Hang on. No, it's all good. It's so funny. Welcome to life. That's, I mean, we have such a bizarre existence these days that nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> no. It's the same with me. Okay, so now it's on mute. Thank I'll talk to you later, Mum. Okay, <laughs> let's just let's just back up. Let's do that question again. So okay. if so, the question was um, uh, about patient, patient care heroes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do that again because then I can okay. edit it straight. Okay. So three, two, one. So Kelly, you've also founded an organization called Patient Care Heroes, um, which is committed to helping people in, in the healthcare profession. Tell us a bit about that. So particularly being in the United States, we saw a void of care for the healthcare community. And when you look at kind of some of the root causes of how people are suffering, we see significant burnout, physician suicide, nursing suicide, depression, PTSD, you name it, we see it. And when you go back in time, a lot of those things existed before COVID, right? And so there was actually a documentary by Robin Simon called Do No Harm. And that looked at physician suicide and the actions that were attempted to be taken to help professionals before the pandemic started. So all that was taped beforehand. So this is not a new problem, it's just COVID has really brought everything to light here. And when you look at some of the root causes, racial equity issues, gender equity issues, and the toxic culture really is where these things take root. And a lot of women just can't deal with the continued toxicity. And so they are leaving. And so we're seeing people leave medicine at a pretty significant rate. Uh, and what's concerning is now that we're into this next wave of Delta, we're seeing a lot of nurses that are 
over it. They're leaving, right? And then interestingly, we also at the same time have this dichotomy of nurses and professionals refusing vaccines and a lot of our institutions now requiring them, leading to more people leaving the system, which is going to put more pressure on the remaining people. And I, I agree, evidence-based medicine all the way, you need to be vaccinated, you need to make sure that you're protecting our patients. So don't get me wrong, full stop, you do need to take care of your health and you do need to be vaccinated. But my concern is this is gonna put a lot more burden on the remaining staff that are already short staffed. And so with Patient Care Heroes, our goal is to be an advocate for individuals, go to the root causes of what's causing this toxic environment. For example, we're working on getting physician licensure to not go against what we call the ADA or the Disabilities Act here. So on physician licensing applications, physicians are asked if they have sought any mental health care. Well, that, stigmatizes it and creates this issue where people are afraid to seek mental health resources. And to be honest, probably all of us could use counseling now and again. Um, I think probably most of us who've been married could say that we could use marriage counseling at some point to kind of help our communication, right? So I think we really need to get away from that stigma. I was hoping that the pandemic would do that. Unfortunately, it, it hasn't. Uh, and so when we look at what is needed, we need to change policy, we need to change attitudes, but we also need to provide resources. And mm -hmm. so Patient Care Heroes is supposed to be a safe hub for people to come and we connect people with things that they need, whether it's artificial intelligence assistance with alcohol abuse, um, because we do have different programs along those lines, or it's depression assistance, or it's connecting them with people who've gone through similar traumas, or someone's dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace and they're depressed and they have PTSD and they don't know where to go and they're thinking about leaving medicine. So our goal is to help be the bridge to get them to a healthier state of mind because the last thing I want is someone to go through these things feeling like they're alone and unsupported. And in the Twin Cities here, we've been all over the news for many reasons, unfortunately, during the last year. Yeah. One of was George Floyd's murder. And so we've had such significant social unrest here that, you know, we need some bright lights and we need some hope and we need someone to come in and give people the support that they need. And so that's what we want to do. We want to be here and we want to support our community. So um, are you only US centric? I mean, do you, do you get inquiries from all over the world at the moment? What, what, what's the feedback? Yeah, so I mean, right now, I mean, we're just US right now. Um, but we, we partnered with a couple other organizations recently, which I think everyone should be aware of because they're great. So LifeWeb360 and Patient Care Heroes have this combination page now where you can honor your loved ones, right? So one of my goals with this organization was to be able to tell our loved ones stories, right? Whether they died by a physician suicide or COVID, or unfortunately, and I think we had talked about this before, there was a nurse that died by gun violence in the Twin Cities here as well. So we want to honor these people. And I think so much of mental health in the healthcare world, as a physician especially, we sweep it under the rug, right? People are afraid to even speak of how their loved one died. And just like I would say, you are not your diagnosis if you had diabetes or you had cancer or you mm -hmm. had HIV or whatever it is, depression exists, anxiety exists. It does not make their life any less meaningful. And I think we really need to get away from that attitude as well, because it's not some embarrassing, horrible thing, which is what I hear from people all over the country. It is something that we should still honor these people. These people still served our community. And so we have this page where you can, you can do a story on your loved one, no matter how they died. Even if you know it's your aunt who died in their eighties and was a nurse, they still contributed to the medical community. So you can do a story, you can share it around with your family or her friends, and you can upload videos and stories and everything else you mm -hmm. want to about them to create, you know, basically like a little treasure for their family. And so I wanted to be able to honor those people. And I also wanted to be able to break some of the cycles of burnout. So we've teamed up with WAMBI, which is an organization here um, in the US. And basically you can do little gratitude postcards electronically for free for people, right? And so I think when a whole community, such as the healthcare community, especially in the United States, feels undervalued and discredited, 
because it's hard for me to correct some of the misinformation that's gone around about the pandemic. It's nice to have someone give you positive feedback or you are going to leave healthcare. I mean, it, you get stuck in this negative tailspin of the pandemic and a lot of us can't get out of it. And so the goal with this is to kind of boost somebody up, put a little pep in their step, tell their loved ones stories, make sure that people are supported and really advocate for changes that we need, especially in the legislature to make sure that we are protecting our healthcare community. Yeah, absolutely. So as a physician, have you often thought about, you know, why mental health and physical health seem to be so separated? I mean, I, I, I read that the very first Secretary General of the United of the World Health Organization was actually a psychiatrist, and he was the one that said there is no health without mental health. Now that was in the sixties, you know, nineteen sixties, and here we are, and we still, you know, the healthcare profession of all professions stigmatizes mental health. I mean, the mind and the body are are one. I mean. Is that talked about in the healthcare profession? It should be. Um, actually, I had a meeting with the uh, um, Minnesota Board of Medicine last week. And in that meeting, we're trying to change the licensure application, right? Because the language is very biased at this point, right? And it does pull out mental health separately. And so there was a colleague on that call who asked, why don't we just say if anyone has a condition that is gonna adversely affect their patient care instead of pulling out mental health as an aside. And the fact of the matter is it's still seen as a weakness, right? So mental health is seen as less of an important issue, less of a, of a functionality, whatever you wanna say about it. Like if I chop my leg off in an accident, that would be looked at more favorably by a lot of my colleagues than if I said I have depression or I have anxiety or I'm struggling. And that is really challenging because it's that stigma and the focus around it's kind of the under subtext of it all is you're weak, you can't cope, suck it up, deal with it. You shouldn't be a doctor if you can't, you know, figure this out on your own. So there's definitely the subtext of the culture and then if you are going out and you're getting therapy or you're doing whatever you do, you are seen as this weak, privileged person um, who doesn't deserve to serve the public. And so I think there's that underlying subtext that is really problematic for people seeking care. Yeah, it's very interesting. As you know, I, I've, I've been very loud and noisy about the insurance industry for a very long time. And um, I mean, this is not really the topic of this conversation, but I, I went back to the root cause of it. And, you know, um, for example, Lloyds of London used to insure um, African slaves, you know, they insured human cargo. So I think some of these organizations that ha are, are responsible for the stigma um, haven't kept up with the times and it's going to require noise, a lot of noise by healthcare professionals and other professionals to say, this narrative has got to change. I mean, the body is the most extraordinary, you know, um, makeup of systems that, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a healthcare practitioner, but I know that, I mean, if one thing's out of sync and we can all identify with having to have those doona days, all of us, you know, like we sit on the lounge and say, I'm just gonna watch Netflix all day. Not good for us, but we can all identify with it. So how well, like that... more of those days. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be great for us. <laughs> oh, but, but, but how does, you know, just the natural way of taking care of yourself make you deficient and if you are overloaded and let's take the pandemic for example i mean relationships work um finances all those things that cause stress converging human beings can't cope with it on every level for sustained periods of time do you think that change can happen or do you think we're going to be stuck in this narrative that we're, we've inherited. Yeah, I mean, I think change is coming and we're gonna force <laughs> it. Well, look at George Floyd. I mean, that's um, just extraordinary. So I, 
I think it's coming, right? I mean, I started out as a random girl from Minnesota and over the course of the last year have developed a coalition of multiple professional organizations. Um, linked inclusion is gonna help work on different things to, to create a different narrative for hospitals and what we should be prioritizing here. Um, so we're really surrounding ourselves with great people who have the right spirit and attitude, who care deeply about people and their safety. And we're gonna push it. And I've been saying this for a long time, medicine can't fix medicine. We are a sick system. Um, it's like a patient who had some sort of ailment. Well, you know, we'll just say cancer because that's near and dear to my heart because I've had a lot of relatives with cancer. You can't cure your own cancer, right? You're too close to it. You can't do your own surgery. You can't dose your chemo. Um, same reason I wouldn't take care of my sister if she was pregnant. You're too close to the situation. And so only in the action of getting other organizations involved are we going to fix this. And so that's exactly what I've been working on over the course of the last year. And I think it has surprised several people uh, because they didn't know these things were going on. And that's the long and the short of it is medicine has existed in a bubble. We have existed decades past in this bubble and we haven't protected women. We haven't held people accountable for harassment or assault in the workplace. Our professional organizations haven't given ramifications for actions. We need a governance system. We need a national system to hold people accountable and to make sure that our trainees are safe. Um, that's another thing that we're working on through this. And so we really need to essentially burn this to the ground and rebuild. And that's exactly the groundwork that we're laying for it. Yeah. So for people that are on the fringes of healthcare, um, you know, I, I'm a chaplain, I work in the healthcare system all the time. How can we help? Well, I honestly bringing awareness to it is really important uh, because again, we existed in a bubble. People had fear around speaking about things, right? Um, there are several things in my career that I legally can't speak to. Um, and when you look at contracts, a lot of us sign contracts in systems or private practices or whatever, and we have non-competes, we have NDAs or non-disparagements, we have mandatory arbitration, right? And so there is fear that someone will ruin your career, you won't be able to find another job, you'll be essentially unemployable, you have a non-compete, you can't work in your community. And so people don't push the narrative, they don't they don't talk about what's going on. They keep their head down. They go to their job because there is this fear. But the studies have really shown that no matter how reserved a woman is, how many awards they have, how many patients mm. they see, they're not going to excel. And they're still often a victim of bullying and harassment and everything else, right? And so no matter how good you think you're being and how perfect you are, which I know a lot of um, women in medicine just want to do their job and go home to their families, no matter how you toe the line and follow the hierarchy, you're likely still gonna be picked apart at some point. And I think, again, we do that to try to self-preserve. However, it doesn't do us any, it doesn't do us any services here, right? Like there's 13% of healthcare CEOs are women. We're not on boards. We're not promoted like men are. And it's not that we're not there. It's not that we're not desiring these positions or to be involved. We're not given the opportunities. And if you look at the minority population, it's worse, right? And so we really need to take a hard look at how we're treating people, who's getting promoted, why are they complicit? Why are they refusing to change? Why are they refusing to support people in whatever need that they have? Because I'll tell you, most of the amazing ideas I hear are not from the people at the top. They're from the people with the boots on the ground that are doing the work day in and day out. And so I think we really need to readjust our leadership structure and not have this hierarch hierarchical situation where the top won't talk to the bottom because let's be honest, again, boots on the ground, you know what's going on in the healthcare system. Ivory tower, you don't really know what's happening. So we need to figure out a way to adjust that so that we can actually put the people with the good ideas in power. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, that's almost a societal issue on a much broader scale because one of the things I notice over and over again is agency. 
like a profession like lawyers, doctors, all sorts of esteemed professions, you think they know it all. Um, they don't. Um, they know their, 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 their skill set, which is what we go to them for. Um, but you have agency and you know when something's not right. So speaking up, if you notice a behaviour change in your doctor, for example, um, would be as simple as saying, are you OK? Um, now, probably professionally it wouldn't be appropriate, but the fact that somebody said, are you OK, is a bit, is a, is a bit of a jolt. Um, and, and, you know, given what we've asked physicians to do during the pandemic, who have gone out day in, day out, and put their lives at risk, you know, many of them have lost their lives, um, their, their families have been at risk, it's time we shone a light. Now, we have cropping up here in Australia from time to time, you know, the issue of bullying and harassment of women, but it goes away. Like it's a headline for a week or two, mm -hmm. and then and then it's next issue. The problem of agency, of equality, and of speaking up has just got to be addressed without ramifications. And and you're right. When you're signing NDAs, you you risk losing your job. You risk never working again. Um, so people keep quiet, and of course that has mental health ramifications. Mm -hmm. We've only got to look at the Me Too movement when women felt safe enough in certain sectors to come forward, it was an avalanche. So, so where to from here, Kelly? I mean, you're, you're one little sector of, you know. Of, of <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it is overwhelming thinking about all the things that we should be doing, right? And so that's why we've got different task forces that we're pushing forward, like the ACGME, call to action task force um, with speak up ortho and that's literally trying to call our one of our training organizations out on how we're protecting residents in training right so we're going to push all the levers we can and the goal is that we will create enough of an avalanche that we will topple it and we will be able to fix these solutions because i'm sick of hearing the stories just like you said you get the headline you get the clickbait and then there's, you know, the sad emojis or whatever it is. And then it's forgotten until there's another physician suicide, right? And so yeah. the problem is we need policymakers. We need, in America, we need Congress. I mean, it's going to take an act of Congress, let's be honest about it, to create this national oversight, um, which we're pushing for, which hopefully we will get accomplished. But that's obviously a long-term project. Um, it's going to take private sector, it's going to take public sector, it's going to take all bodies and all hands on deck here. But I'll be honest, it's not going to be the healthcare system itself, because there's no incentive to healthcare fixing itself, because it's functioning, it's moving, they replace a nurse with a traveling nurse, if too many are leaving, they, you know, are bringing people in from I mean, they're essentially importing people to fill the voids because of mismanagement across the country. And so instead of saying, okay, what, what are our issues here? How can we fix this and create an environment where people want to stay? We are saying that yep, we're fine. We're going to train more nurses and we're going to bring more people in from across the country. So just that attitude alone is really at the crux of why we're struggling here. And that combined with everything else in the pandemic is why we're seeing all these people leave healthcare. So we're going to get it together. We're going to push these levers. We're going to topple it, but we are going to need as many people to be aware, um, to reach out if they need help, because I don't want people feeling alone if they are having issues. Because to be honest, like once you get into this spiral of depression and thinking about suicide, and then you have a plan. Like the scariest part for me as a physician and a friend and a colleague is when you have a plan, right? And so yeah. we want to make sure people are reaching out before they get to that point. And then we need to create a stable foundation for them that they can stand on where they don't have to fear losing their job to get resources, which is why we're working with states to change the physician licensing application so that they don't fear retaliation or losing their livelihood as most of us have hundreds of thousand dollars worth of debt. And so if we can create some sort of stable foundation just so they can take a breath and get the care they need, then we can move forward as a healthy group 
and then we can change the things that we so desperately need to change. And it's going to take you and I and everyone having open, honest, authentic conversations about it, because I think, again, the fear factor is pretty significant. Um, and that's why I decided to, to write my book, Delivering Love is the, the working title now, but to tell my story and also to tell the story of some of my patients who amazingly agreed to incorporate that into the book, because I wanted to be able to share some authenticity with people to start the conversations, because it's only in our vulnerability that we're going to create this honest dialogue. And so if we can do that, then we might have a chance at getting everything done. It's really so interesting. I mean, you said about our story and everyone's got a story and, yep. and we, we often turn around and say, oh, you're so brave to have told that story. The reality is you're the hero of your, your own story right. and you write the later chapters. Whatever's happened, you're in charge of recontrolling your narrative. So well done, Kelly, for, for, for I mean, putting... We all have to be our own main character, right? Absolutely. I mean, and you know, I was tired of playing the supporting character. And so at some point you have to say, you know what, I want a bigger role in my own life. And I think that that is when my attitude changed. Like I was tired of just being on the bench waiting for, you know, the opportunity to play with the guys. Like I was done with it. We need to change our story. We need to change our collective story so that we can heal from everything that's gone on in the past. Absolutely. So, so in, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about self-care school, why we started it. We found when people were in crisis, they actually had no self-care coping um, tools to fall back on. So no one teaches this stuff. And rather ironically, it is systems of the past and the whole wellness industry that actually hijacked what self-care is. So we've got you know, with no disrespect, because yoga retreats are fun and bath bombs are indulgent. But mental health, you know, it's a continuum. And we all go up and down through the natural cycle of life events that, that happen. So we have a situation where physicians, um, lawyers, everyone, they have no tools to anchor into when they need to. And some of those tools are simple things like learning how to breathe properly and breathe through a situation. Like it takes the body apparently nearly 60 minutes to settle down once it's really been hyper aroused. But physicians know these things, but they don't necessarily build them into their lives, do they, Kelly? So no, they do. Not at all, actually. I think we're the worst patients that we possibly could have. Absolutely. So it's really important that we start to to talk about mental health, to reach out for help, and then to learn skills that'll help us through those dark periods, which we all have, all have, and 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 to rebuild the healthcare system. And it's not just in the US; it's in Australia as well. I've got a situation at the moment where both my elderly parents are in hospital with COVID, and. Yeah, very challenging. Sorry, that's, that's, I mean, that's horrible because you're probably it, feeling pulled in a million different directions. Well, what, what's been really interesting, A, we couldn't see them, thank goodness for mobile phones or cell phones as you call them, but B, the amplification through a telephone of what the healthcare system is like has been an extraordinary lesson because you can hear it. And we've had to say to my parents who are now coming out but the isolation is becoming an issue, an issue as you can appreciate um hang in there they're just so busy that you know they run off their feet you can hear it um and similarly i had to say to one of the head nurses the other day who clearly was doing her best absolutely without question and i had to say are you okay um because i knew Mm -hmm. that she was short staffed, that she was managing many, many bushfires. I could hear it. And, you know, naturally she smoothed it over. But she rang me on an excuse the day afterwards and said, just wanted to let you know I've done this, this and this, and thank you so much for, for your kind words. So I jolted her. Um, and, and, and we can all do that, all of us. It, it's the little things that we do. Like, it, it's a symbiotic relationship patient and doctor you know it's mutual benefit because 
doctors are there to heal. That's the primary goal of our health system, which doesn't necessarily always happen that way. And patients are there for care. So, you know, it can, it can, it can work both ways. So Kelly, let me just ask a couple of final questions. Um, when's your book out? Um, it's coming out in September. And um, the reason why I chose September is it's actually Women in Medicine Month here. Uh -huh. and also Physician Suicide Awareness Day is September 17th. So we're shooting for the 17th, but you know how yeah. books coming out. You know how it is. <laughs> and, and, so. in, and in September, you also have Royal Suicide Prevention Day. So um, that's fabulous. You want to give us a quick little couple second pricey of what the book's about? Sure. So um, it's a true story. It's a memoir. So um, I wrote different essays, with different snippets of my life, and then how I saw patient situations through my eyes. And so in that, I talk about assault. I talk about abuse. I talk about postpartum anxiety and depression. Um, one of my patients who had lost a child, I had the honor of being able to talk about that. And so I even talk about female genital mutilation, which is still occurring in all over the world, right? And so it's really important for us to understand that women's health is also important because I think that women have been undervalued and we have not addressed all of the issues that we need to address in appropriately caring for people. And so I wanted to create a safe place for all of these conversations, especially medical training, right? So of course I talk about my medical training, some of the issues with that, some of the things that we can do to move forward to make it safer for all people who wanna be in medicine. And so I mostly just created this so that we could learn from these stories together and open the conversation and dialogue up for everybody. Wow. So I don't know what that noise is, but anyway, we'll, we'll worry about that later. Welcome to technology. Um, so, so tell me, Kelly, um, as the last couple of questions, how do you look after yourself? How do you practice self-care? What do you do for yourself? You know, that's a great question. Um, so one of the things that I started doing whenever I'm off um, on a day, I wake up early and I take my kids out to a park and we have some sort of breakfast picnic, right? So since COVID started and we can't go to restaurants, my children are six and eight, so they can't be vaccinated yet. We will bring food to a park. We'll go for a walk around the lake. That has become a really important routine for me because it's literally me separating from computer, cell phone, you know, whatever it is, because you know, we're contacted a million times a day for many, many, many different things. And so that's like my moment in the day to just kind of like separate from everybody except my kids. So that's been, that's been probably the most important thing for me to have just kind of a sacred moment with them where I'm not pulled in different directions. And then aside from that, you know, I think we all go through this process differently, right? We have different things that come up. We have grieving that we have to do. And I think for me personally, allowing myself to feel whatever I feel, right? Whether it's yeah. grief because of losing someone that I love or it's you know, grief because we lost the life that we had, right? Whatever that may look like. You need to allow yourself to feel those things instead of fighting them because then it allows you to break out of those moments more quickly. And that's something that I had to work through, you know, over years, let's be honest. <laughs> you know, but As we all do, I think, yeah. I think, yeah. um, I used to try, try to like stuff it down and not feel it. And then it would come out in different ways, whether I was more crabby with my kids or whatever it may be. And so you need to take that time to be real with yourself and authentic with yourself and feel whatever you need to feel so that you can communicate better with your partner or your friends or whoever's in your life and then have these honest conversations. Because again, in healthcare, just like my military friends would tell you, it's kind of like you just stuff it down, don't talk about it, sign of weakness, right? And for, for my learning process, I needed to figure out, okay, this is how I process. I need to experience it. And then I'm a talker, which you probably could tell. So normally, you know, one of my best friends or my sister, who is, you know, one of my soulmates, because I think sisters can be soulmates. Um, and you just, you need to hash it out with your people. So I've got to ask on, on that great wisdom and insight in medicine, in training, 
Are you given any training on emotional literacy to understand emotions and feelings? No. <laughs> oh. I, re- I rest my case why we have no, self-care not. school. Um, yeah. That is a learning on the job, figuring out how to live your life situation. And I think most of us go into medicine because we care about people and we are mm. empathetic and we want to love people and take care of them. And, you know, cause we cherish human life and we want to make sure that we're there to support people. And so we invest so much of ourselves and our work that we don't even know how to invest back into oh, yeah. ourselves. Yeah, and yeah. it's that like need for external validation and taking care of people. We don't even know how to exist as autonomous people. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm a great advocate for when I'm sitting with somebody, we call it sitting in the mud when, and it's a privilege, a bit like what you talk about in walking on somebody's journey. Things are, they're in great despair usually. But one of the things we always recommend is first of all, go see your general practitioner or your, your, your physician, have, check, have a check in and do you have a therapist? Um, and, and we say, uh, which is, it's not as, um, mandated like it is in the US in terms of therapy, although it has been throughout the pandemic, but we actually say everybody needs somebody to talk to and everybody needs language around emotions. And you're quite right, if you get no training in medicine, yet you'll see all these amazing experiences of people going through trauma and all sorts of things, but with no coping for yourselves, it's, it's natural. Um, that people will come unstuck from time to time. So insurance industry, I hope you're listening um, because that's a big message. So Kelly, I want to say thank you so much for this conversation. Will you come back and talk to us when your book's out and perhaps we'll do a review? Yeah, I would I would love to. I'm, all, I'm always here. If anyone needs anything, feel free to reach out. And we'd love to help uh, patient care here in the future. So we look forward to working with you. Thanks for joining us, Kelly. Thanks for having me.